This is an incredibly large symmetry for the temporal aspect of time. Let's now go over each part of the metric in turn. First, we note that the signature stays with the pseudo-Riemannian signature minus plus plus plus, as can be quickly seen. Next, we've allowed the flat space-time to also have a uniform curvature, which is encapsulated in the denominator for the dr squared component. This brings in our spatial metric from before, and just to make things deliberately confusing, I've converted back to using the reduced circumference coordinates for the spatial metric. It's a quite a bit easier than carrying around the s sub kr function thingy, and since we've learned previously that a change in coordinates doesn't change the metric, this version describes the same space, but with a different definition for the radial component. We can just go back and forth between the coordinate choices, using the one that makes our current job easier. Again, we maintain spatial homogeneity and isotropy around every point in the spatial portion, and we allow the spatial part to now have a globally uniform curvature. This extension of the Minkowski metric is really not a big deal. The Minkowski metric is just a special case, and if the curvature is large enough, and we choose a small enough region in that space, it's really hard to tell if the space has curved at all. This means that for a large curvature, we can always find a small spot that is locally flat, which will be very important later. It's also important to note that this spatial metric portion is called maximally symmetric. This means that every point is equally special in this space, or if you will, there are no special points in the entire space. Next, we look at the scale factor A of t. It is only a function of time. It essentially says that the space that underpins every ruler or measuring stick grows at the same rate as all the others in the entire space. The scale factor is the way to expand or contract space across history as some function of time. From a Riemannian manifold perspective, this merely means that our definition of length is variable, and the concept of length itself begins to look more like an angular measurement, which is unitless. In this particular formation of the metric, however, the metric scale factor is some unitless number, and r still carries units of length. Wherever the units live in this equation, the scale factor affects all points in the maximally symmetric spatial metric equally. Little r is a real distance that increases by some factor as time passes. It could decrease, or it could do some wibbly-wobbly, timey-wimey thing. Importantly, because of the maximal symmetry of the spatial portion of the metric, the scale factor is not a function of location or orientation. It is an integral part of the configuration of the homogeneous and isotropic space, and that makes it completely independent of the position in the space. On the lower right, I've given a couple of hints as to how it appears in the standard FLRW cosmology. On the top is the evolution of the scale factor as a function of time for the standard lambda CDM cosmology. Dot A is the first time derivative of the scale factor. All the omegas are just numbers that give the current cosmological densities compared to flat space of cold dark matter, baryonic matter, radiation, curvature, and dark energy. All the omegas are observable, as is the Hubble constant, h sub naught. Once you know these observables, then you know the scale factor's full evolutionary history and its future. In practical terms, it is typically very hard to get these omegas, so the next easiest thing is to say, I have no idea how it evolves, but I can try to get some values out of some distance using an approximation. And that's what the last equation on the right is all about. It's a Taylor expansion of A as a function of time. Here, we don't assume that we have any idea what the actual functional relationship that the scale factor has with time. We just try to find some distant objects that give us a recession velocity at various cosmically large distances. If the recession speed varies with distance and isn't a strict linear Hubble law throughout the universe, then we'll get a first approximation for the acceleration or deceleration of the universe according to the scale factor. To let the cat out of the bag, it was the study of this last equation and its observational consequences that led to the discovery of dark energy. Lastly, the scale factor only affects the expansion of space. It does not affect people or planets or galaxies. So the cartoon across the bottom says that we can watch the universe expand around us. Our stick man is not moving anywhere, but he's moving forward in time. As the time advances for an unmoving galaxy, the distance between Stickman and the far galaxy grows by the scale factor. 
So what exactly is this time here? Back in our special relativity studies, we learned that time measurements can be different due to the relative motion of the observer and the emitter of a signal. This is also true of spatial measurements. I went further and charted out the extensive experimental evidence for the relativity of both space and time. But here, we have a time that appears to be outside of all that stuff going on. And we're going to call it the cosmic time. This haughty name seems to imply there's a single clock governing all space-time, but that's not the case. Our time component is the time that is measured by an observer at the center or origin of the coordinate system. It may sound dodgy to allow space to be uniform, isotropic, and homogeneous, but the time is only valid for an observer at the center of these coordinates. However, if you take a step back and notice that this cosmic time would be what's measured at any observer at any point in the cosmos. Wait, that still sounds kind of dodgy, but the time cannot be simultaneously measured anywhere except at the observer's location. All times farther away are necessarily measured as being some time ago. This formulation of cosmic time implies that we look back in time the further in the distance we look. This means that the cosmic time is homogeneous for all observers in the universe because the behavior of this metric will be the same at all locations. Also, the cosmic time is isotropic. As we look back in time, the farther out in space we look, the farther back in time we look. And this look back time is 100% the same in all directions. If it were not isotropic, then we would measure time passing faster in one direction than another. This would mean that the oldest galaxies would be different in one direction than another. And that's not what we measure. We measure all directions as having the same age for a given radial distance. Therefore, we can be happy with our definition of cosmic time. It's just what we measure to be right here. Look back time, then, is relative to our clock right here. What we can say about some clock way over there measuring the cosmic time on some planet in a galaxy 100 megaparsecs away is that they'll measure us to be in the past relative to them. We've therefore tied the cosmic time to light traveling along null geodesics. We can then derive meaning from look-back time by surmising what a distant galaxy might look like today due to known physics. So unlike the special relativistic flat, unchanging space, our allowance of an expanding spatial metric gives rise to this use of cosmic time. Our current choice for cosmic time being the time measured by the observer at the center of the coordinate system can be more accurately stated as the time measured by a fundamental observer surrounded by objects in a co-moving coordinate system that is being carried by the expansion described by the scale factor. But what does that mean? To answer that, we need to go back to our scale factor cartoon. Let's say we somehow know that the distant galaxy is not moving at all locally. It's at rest at its home. This would be possible if it were an isolated field galaxy far from any clusters. Let's say it's in the gravitational balance point between a bunch of galaxy clusters. Then, in this case, our theta phi coordinates would not change at all as the time passes. But the distance between Stickman and Far Galaxy would still grow. We call these coordinates co-moving coordinates. It means that these coordinates are merely tick marks on a ruler, but not their physical size. The scale factor determines their physical dimensions. To see the difference, let's pretend you've been handed, by some guy, a thing called a stick. On this stick, we're told to mark 10 large, equally spaced tick marks. We are then asked to mark 10 smaller tick marks between each of those big tick marks. We then do it again between those. So now we've got 1,000 equally spaced ticks on a stick. Well, that's great, says the guy who handed you the stick. Well done. But this guy's a bit of a jerk, and he doesn't tell us about the stick. He then takes both ends of the stick and pulls on them. The stick expands, spreading out all the ticks on the stick equally. How long is the stick? The stick went from being maybe a meter long, and now it's 10 meters long? It was scaled up by a factor of 10 in the time it took the guy to pull on both ends of the stick. Notably, all the ticks still have the same relative relationship with respect to each other. The physical size of all the lengths on the stick has gone up by a factor of 10, but the tick locations themselves relative to each other did not change. That's the sense of co-moving coordinates. They are the tick marks on the rulers that permeate the universe. They don't have physical dimensions in of themselves, but the scale factor of the expansion bestows that physical length upon them. 
That's why I started the story calling it a stick rather than a meter stick. Why? Our story does some conceptual damage because the story says that the expansion happens to an object in a space that itself doesn't experience the expansion. But co-moving coordinates in an expanding universe do not indicate that there's a space into which they are expanding, just like a manifold having a constant curvature, which is an inherent property of the space itself and does not rely on an embedded physical extra dimension. This expansion is the same thing. How might you ask? The best analogy that I can think of is this. Take the integers, the counting numbers. These can be your ticks on a stick. Now double every number. Now you're counting by twos, but the distance between two numbers has jumped by a factor of two. But you still have exactly the same number of ticks on a stick as before, and the actual size of the infinite set of integers has not changed at all. And we haven't expanded the integers into, say, the real numbers. They're still the integers. This analogy is pretty loose, but it gets at the idea that the size of the distance between the integers is not actually a property of the integers. We don't need more integers in order to keep an infinite set of integers that are twice as large. It's just a property of the cardinality of the integers. The takeaway here is that co-moving coordinates do not change as the universe expands unless the distant objects have their own proper space motions.